This is episode four, and we're going to try something a little bit different today. I'm going to do my first show with a guest. It's going to be an interview today, um, and we just hope that that guest today turns up. Well, who could that be? Perfect timing. Who's that ringing the bell at Radio Owl's Nest today? Well, he happens to be a very good friend of mine, an amazing musician. He's worked with me for many years, seems to have survived, but we'll ask him about that. Maybe he hasn't. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to a superb drummer, Trevor Thornton. Hello, Trevor. Well, hello, Martin. It's lovely to be here. Well, that's the kind of thing I've told you to say. Well, I'm reading from the script that you handed me when I walked in. <laughs> yes, you're very well rehearsed. Now, Trevor, Trevor is the most amazing drummer in the world. He's worked with me from day one, right? Right from the beginning. That's right, right at the beginning. Okay, so now, getting into all seriousness, I'm going to tell about the uh, history of Trevor very quickly. He was in q Phil. He was also in the incredible band Asia for two years. He worked with Kim Wilde. Well, she had that huge, huge career in England. Um, and he was in a band called One Nation with Kipper. Kipper, that's right, yeah. He was uh, the Sting guy, right? Yeah, he went on to... Um produce and play with sting yeah and you were in that heavy heavy english rock band very successful saxon saxon how i was you, a saxon boy how did you survive that uh i'm not sure i actually <laughs> did <laughs> no you did not survive I, that, I, did I you? am actually quite damaged from that experience yeah, yeah. so Tre trev's going to stay with me through this hour show we'll be stopping and playing a few tracks in between and uh Tre Trevor's actually played on about 45 of my songs and you'll be hearing some of bits of that. It's really all, great. All at the same time. All at the same time in stereo. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds better if you do that. Um, but I want to ask Trevor some uh, questions here. And I've got my first question is, when did you first start playing drums? When I was about seven, a wee young nipper at seven. And what made you want to play drums at seven years old? I mean, I was thinking about playing football and kicking a ball around. Uh, I copied everything my elder brother did. And he started taking drum lessons at school. And, um, and then he basically didn't keep it up. He stopped. But I followed him into practicing drums. Uh, but I stuck with it. You know, I actually got a big kick out of hitting things with sticks. Did, you, did your parents, you know, give you a, a, a drum kit early on? No, no. I, I was using the old pots and pans, uh, the old phone books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would sit and watch Top of the Pops. Yeah, I did And too. mimic, mimic yeah. the drummers on TV. I, it was quite a shock, actually, when I got my first drum kit and I realised there was a thing called a bass drum pedal. Ugh. I didn't know how to use that to start with. So, but that, you know, I didn't get to my first drum kit until I was about 13. Mm. And did you always want, always want to be a drummer? Only when I started. I'd, I actually, I'll tell you what really, really got me going is um, my brother took me to see Deep Purple. It was at the old Sundown, which was the Brixton Astoria. I think it's now called the Academy. Yeah. Um, but Deep Purple played there and we just bought, or he just bought the Machine Head album by Deep Purple. And that's one of your favourites still, isn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, mm. Ian Pace is the reason I play the drums. Wow. And so I was like really young. I might have been only nine or ten years old. We went to see Deep Purple and uh, he did his drum solo i managed to get my way down to the front there and wow. i the, the 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 vibe and the feel of his drums and it his drum solo made me cry emotionally because it was just an it just sounded incredible and you were you were down the front right right i i worked my way all the way down the front he took the solo and it was just incredible. I could feel the power from his kick drum on my face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew at that moment, it's like, that is what I'm going to do. Wow. I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing that because mm. that is amazing. That's, that's, that's a brilliant story because it, you felt it more than anything else. Uh, oh, yeah. You know? it, I was really quite moved. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great lead in to play a new song that Trevor's been working with me on. It's a brand new song called Sink Into Me. Like a prayer 
brand new song uh, and uh, unfinished. A lot of the pieces you're going to hear that Trevor's played on are unfinished pieces, but I thought it would be nice to let you hear the amazing stuff he's been doing with me recently. And Trev, um, all your influences, I mean, so many people influenced you, right? And and I also know from working with you for such a bloody long time is that John Bonham's a big influence, right? Oh, yeah. Led Zeppelin yeah, man. Yeah. Well, obviously, to start with, it was all the you're, English. You're a, hard, you're a hard rock boy, it sounds, at this well, point. Well, I, I, my roots are in that kind of thing. I was a rock drum at the start with, well, because, you know, I liked playing things hard loud but yeah mm. loud so i used to i used to like practice uh, the who black sabbath yeah, yeah. led zeppelin deep purple all those you know early english rock bands well how the Genesis. hell did, how did, yeah how the hell did you end up with martin page and q feel uh well you know it was just, were, you, you, were know. you looking for work or something well, I was just, I, that was through my struggling time. You know, I was struggling. The, du- the dark yeah, period. Yeah, the dark period. <laughs> I've got to say here, though, um, is that you are one of those drummers, Trev, that can play so many different styles. I know our my history when I went into London... Um, we joined a band, both you and I, called the Charlie Mullen Band, right? Yeah. Now, this, there was a lot of soul music and pop music, although there was a little bit of heaviness, like Thin Lizzy, we liked. But um, I remember thinking you were an all-rounder. You you could play so many different styles, you know, ballad, reggae, right across to an easygoing song to an all-out rocker and jazz. So um, how did you develop from that? Hard rock, you know the, big, the 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 loud Led Zeppelins and the and the Black Sabbaths. How, what made you also develop into like in a way a session drummer? Well, I discovered this country called America, uh, and then I uh, I realised there were a lot of other drummers in the world other than those English rock drummers. Yeah, and I discovered like the world of jazz and the session players. So I discovered like uh, Jeff Beccaro, uh, Steve Gadd, mm. uh, Billy Cobham, and well, all these amazing other drummers. The and elite. Just, yeah. The elite. Yes. Yeah. I, mm. That just opened my eyes to, you know, a whole new world of drumming. So then, you know, I pretty much got all these English drummers down. I had mimicked them and practiced them. And would, would that have been, you know, the Keith Moons? And, yeah, uh, well, Keith Moons, John Bonhams, you know, uh, Ian Paces. But not Ringo. Uh, but not Ringo, no. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Yeah, all right yeah, then, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, bless him. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so then I discovered all these great American drummers, so I started to learn and try and mimic those guys and practice to what they played. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, obviously that developed my chops quite a bit because they, they you know, was playing a lot of very sophisticated kind of stuff. Absolutely. It, yeah. I, and I've got to say here... I, I learned from records, you know, buying vinyl records and 45s and putting a, putting the old needle onto the disc and playing along with it. So how did, did you learn from records when you were practicing, listening to Steve Gadd, listening to Jeff Beccaro, Toto? Come, how did you that, learn? That's really all you could do, either cassettes or records. And the funny thing is, unlike today when you can get a program or an app, and slow things down mm. you you had to get a record and what you do is fiddle it so you could like put your thumb yeah, on the turntable i beli- can't believe we did that right know? and you'd slow it down to figure out a groove yeah, or yeah. something or you just had to listen to it and listen to it. it it was very hard but you got the idea what they were doing what a way to train yeah know? absolutely yeah that so you were buying records you were oh buying yeah, yeah 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 you yeah. were a collector like me right absolutely i had a quite a, a vast record collection yeah well, what a good time to play another brand new song. i um, actually working on this now, so it's just a phonetic uh, guide vocal. But Trevor's been doing an amazing drum arrangement on it. And it's a song called May I Walk in Beauty. It hurts my love to be there In the brown and of the day When all the lights have fallen down I have lost my way And crowded I must be And I don't know where to turn For all the lies that beckon me Well, how I'll ever learn My life on a bread mark up 
So it's just a guide vocal, and I'm finding my way through it. You're hearing um, a real rough of that that Trevor's helping me with, with a terrific um, kind of Simon and Garfunkel, kind of bridge over troubled water, kind of drum thing. What do you think, Trev? Yes, he's nodding. That's called um, May I Walk in Beauty. So let me just tell you the history here, because uh, it's my show. It's not Trevor's, it's my show. Oh, so I it's really all, it's really all about me. So all right, right. I came into London, and I was looking for bands to, to play with, and went for a few auditions, and uh, I joined, well, we, I joined a band called the Charlie Mullen Band. This is, a, this is a band that I think will go down in infamy and, uh, and history, uh, and... There was this young drummer. He was the youngest player in the band. We were all veterans, and that was Trevor. He was the baby of the band. And what about this Charlie Mullen band, he, Trev? Tell me about it. He, he was quite a character. Yeah, he was, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, so Charlie was this, you know, guy. He was like half musician, half businessman. Yes. A bit of an entrepreneur. Really fancied himself. Maybe a con man. Maybe. Uh, yeah, uh, there was a bit of con man yeah. in there, yeah. Um <clears throat> Yeah, like uh, like when you say uh, what is he doing now? I think it's ten to fifteen in Leavenworth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I keep on going on the <laughs> I keep on going on the internet to find him. Yeah, but, right. I, but I end up going towards police reports to go. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the place uh, I'll yeah, find him. I, I know because there is a story, isn't there? We 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 toured with him for a while in London. Did these really big gigs and with you know like we played all the top shows in London. It was yeah. amazing. Anch- yeah, was it Hope and Anchor, the venue, all these the Nashville, all the these Dingwalls? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mar- the music machine. Mar- we played the marquee. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking, and he he, he had this money somehow. It was it was like he a, got backing from some guys. A consortium yeah, was yeah. paying, and we were all being paid quite good wages. And then he rented a house in North London, a huge house where I had a room up at the top of the right. Yeah, and you yeah. lived in that house with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, they'd have all sorts of comings and goings of like uh, you know record people and like producers. Well, we and, actually yeah. thought this is very professional. Oh yeah, yeah, this is going to yeah. happen. Yeah. I, I think the money had something to do with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. it did. And and I remember that we um, we did about six really really big gigs. Then it started to collapse. Although you and I, and Trevor, stayed very close to each other. And I met Brian Fairweather. Right, so right. This is really where Qfield came from. Well, because, because three... uh, he was auditioning guitarists. That's right. I mean, the funny thing is, he was actually auditioning auditioning drummers too that's right even though i was the drummer yeah it's ridiculous band. wasn't it and i think we used your drum kit for auditions yeah, didn't so we? so when there wasn't a drummer to audition just a guitarist i would play the drums and martin would be on bass and we had dave fisher on keyboards that's right liver puddling yeah, keyboard yeah player. right yeah. great and, mm. and and i would play the drums and then when a drummer came along to uh, audition Bizarre. i would step to one side and it was like <laughs> you know but the funny thing is i ended up staying in the gig i guess well you know. what it was trev and i'll say this now we had about 20 uh, we advertised in this thing which you do in the papers in england when you're a musician the melody maker yeah and charlie mullen had made me the sort of band leader so i put this ad out and uh, we had about 40 guitarists arrive from all over the world and uh, yes brian fairweather came down from scotland and became my partner in q and uh, trevor was our drummer then but we said let's do in indi- for some reason let's do auditions uh, with everybody else we had 40 drummers come through nobody was as good as trevor and so we had to say trevor get back on your kit 
you are the drummer of the Charlie Mullen band. Right, yes. Yeah. Stay is, on the drums. Stay you, on the, yeah. It's your kit. Yeah. You should be sat there. Now, yeah, Trev, right, right. we have to remember, Trevor was very young yeah, in that band to us. And it was, I suppose we, we, we all think like, okay, we're going to find somebody else of, us, uh, of our age group. But Trevor just outshone everybody. But that was the beginning, really, of the Q-Phil, because I met with you. Uh, Charlie, we'll, we'll go back to that again. The strange thing about Charlie is we believe that when that band broke up charlie went to prison i think uh, there's rumors that he conned some politicians out he of conned the wrong people yeah, yeah. so uh, i remember coming to la this is an interesting story because after you've worked with charlie you sort of go on a run a little bit and you don't really want to be found by him for some peculiar reason he hunted each musician down and we joined his band and then we thought this is pretty intense so i came to la with brian we had a we were working with earth wind and fire and charlie charlie called through to our management company and we thought oh my god he's run, found run, us he's, he's found, found us and he was just calling to be to congratulate us but then we heard that he went into wormwood scrubs i believe now wormwood scrubs is a a, a well-known prison in very England. famous english prison and he yes. may still well be there in london yes uh, right, right. so that was the beginning of us but getting on to brighter things oh, i just want to point mm -hmm. out a little bit of trivia here mm. regarding the charlie mullen band do you remember when we did those shows we had a sax player do you remember i do and his name was mal collins mal collins and he was a very famous sax player he was playing with kokomo at the time oh and i loved kokomo yeah uh, yeah I, and now you you you've jogged my brain yes. yeah and yeah. i remember he came down for the first rehearsal <laughs> and he wasn't sure what and he's and after the rehearsal he said i brought the check in my back pocket i weren't sure if he was gonna have to tear it up or not <laughs> But, but that says it all <laughs> but i just thought i'd you know like no that's true because yeah. we were playing the venue and suddenly we had this star sax player who'd never rehearsed with us before but it, there he was he was put up there yeah and we all nodded at him and as a bass player i was like that's 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 mel what is that your name mel collins mel collins yeah, and, I, yeah. and he played with roxy music and i loved kokomo because it's one of those english funk bands had great session players right and i think he played he, he played six gigs with us and he just sort of smiled at me like yeah. i'd be <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to get out of this. And I, I was nodding at him ever, and he was playing per, 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 little solos. Oh, yeah, little bits and pieces. Yeah. And yeah, he was yeah, just yeah. smiling, and I thought, he's probably smiling because the amount of money he's he being would, paid, yes, and yeah, we yeah. aren't. And, and I think it just added, added a little credibility to the band to have someone famous in the band. It yeah. did. I think he was quite happy to escape after six gigs. Yes, you know? yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, you brought my mind back to that. Here's a new track um, that I'm working on with Trevor with the working title of Animus Anima, male, female. Uh, we were talking about Brand X and its experimental music and Trevor jumped on this sort of Japan backing track I've got and just listen to um, how Trev funks this.
that's a track we're working on. Um, pure rough you're hearing there, early days. Um, it's, at the moment it's got a working tour title of Animus Anima. And we were, uh, Trevor and I, just talking about when Phil Collins joined Brand X and we were talking about Trevor's work with Asia and um, all the progressive music. And I was feeling like, um, as I was developing this track, I wanted uh, to express myself in that kind of landscape. And Trevor jumped on it. We're trying to actually, me, Brian and Trevor, maybe uh, do some more work for the QFIL thing because we're still alive. Unbelievable, we're still alive. And, and it's taken us back to um, all those memories when we first um, got together uh, back in the old days. But they were really formative years because we were, uh, I was playing live with Trevor then. And, and, uh, and I'll I bring this up now that in those days, rhythm sections were really, really important. And I remember thinking I've re as a bass player, you know, it's not that now is it with Pro Tools, everybody working in their bedrooms, but a bass player had to be able to link well with the drummer. That was what was really important in records and in live bands. You used to look at the rhythm section and say, that's a great rhythm section, like the average white band. And I remember really playing with Trevor and really concentrating on just that unit wasn't it that just mm -hmm. the bass player and the drummer had to really be tight right well working with you and Brian the way we did so closely set me up for everything I did after that rehearsal wise because you were quite a hard taskmaster in that you would set up like okay we're going to work around the chorus now and we're just going to cycle the chorus yeah, yeah. and we'd go over and over and over I was a bastard yeah well yeah yeah but you were a, a, a nice looking bastard I was a nice bastard yeah you, yeah you were as bastards go yeah true but I mean the thing is <laughs> every gig I ever yeah. did after that was almost easy because no one worked sex like you did but it meant when we played or when yeah, we recorded yeah, yeah. something yeah, yeah. there was it was so tight yes. to, so together uh, I take that as a huge compliment Trevor. but I remember I think our fans remember here Dancing in Heaven the first song that really brought uh, me over to America and was my ticket to working here Trevor played excuse me about to burp from the tea um, Trevor played live drums on that Dancing in Heaven you wouldn't you wouldn't really think it when you listen to that track because we were highly synchronized and it was a very fast high tech record and we we made a 12 inch on the spot so you're playing for six minutes and uh trevor just nailed that down and i think i can remember going to trevor's house as we used to do in those days and spend a whole day with him talking about every bloody beat on that song you know? right, right right and uh but then we came in the studio mike shipley we engineered it and, and i remember uh, we, and <laughs> In those days, we'd say, no fills, Trevor. Do not stay on the beat. Just stay. Bushka, bushka. It's a dance record. Do not do any fills. Do not show off. But if you listen to the end of Dancing in Heaven, only on the 12-inch, we do this. We do this horn thing, which I think I was following from Earth, Wind and Fire. But Trevor had to wait something like five minutes before he goes, ba ba and, I, and he's reading. And there's another... 250 point. bars later. Good good Yeah. You can still remember that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Trevor writes everything down. And this is a good point to bring this up. This is a drummer that writes everything down, scores it down. Right, Trevor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just found it was very useful to be able to make a roadmap of the uh, the track and then put any figures or grooves into that. Yeah. And then... More often than not, once you record it for the first time, there's a couple of little changes. Mm -hmm. And rather than try and remember exactly what it is, there's a little change here, we want a little skip there or a little break there. Mm -hmm. You know, you just like write it into the chart so you can go in and pretty much play it with the changes the next time. Well, it's, it's to me, you know, I, all the drummers I've played with, and I, I will say here that I really feel very fortunate because over my career, I've been, in, I've, as a rhythm man, I've been able to have my songs played by drummers that I used to absolutely adore as a kid. So I've had John Robinson, you know, Rufus and Quincy Jones. He played on Maurice White's album. Um, Picaro, Jeff Picaro, played on a Paul, Paul Young album I did. Uh, Vinnie Kawaluta played on, on another track with um, Paul Young. Uh, Manu Caché played on Four and Angel when I was working. So I, I had this luxury of just, a, you know, and Jimmy Copley played on House of Stone and Light, and he was Tears for Fears. And, Phil uh, Collins. Phil, uh, thank you, Trev. You know, Phil Collins played on yeah, on that album as well. So I sort of had this wonderful luxury of being, you know, the, the, some of the players I grew up loving were playing on some of the songs I wrote. And I have to say now that they're all, they were all much better than Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really saying a lot, though, is it? I mean, 
<laughs> I mean, I grew I up listening. I appreciate it. I'm being honest. I grew up listening to those guys too. I mean, they were all big heroes of mine. Yeah. Now, I got to, you know, why, why I bring that up is that Trevor's recently been working with me in the last two years. I mean, it's a dream, really. Trevor lives around the corner from me. Can you believe Q Phil all lives in the same area and in America? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. We're all in here Burbank, Encino in California. But Trevor uh, has been working on like f- about 40 to 50 songs of my new work and, and on my, one of my new albums. And I've got to say, and I, as we were working, I said, you know, you're my drummer. I mean, f- Trevor is just a, an incredible um, songwriter's drummer as well. And I, f- I found that with uh, the drummers we're talking about there. Um, Trevor thinks about the song. I mean, it's a dream for a songwriter. But isn't that the way that you've always seen it, Trevor? Well, I don't see it any other way. I mean, there's, I, I feel there's a certain part for a song, and um, you know, I'm, I work it out. I figure out, you know, I don't just come up with the, and play the first thing that comes to mind. I want to try different things out, and I know there's a certain rhythm or pattern that works for each song. Well, that's a perfect intro, Trev, into uh, a new song that I'm building up at this point. And all the songs we're hearing are rough off the board because we haven't finished them and I'm working on them now. So um, lots of premieres going on here. A song called Blaze. And really the song is uh, about how we have a short time here in our lifetime to make a mark. And Trevor has been helping me realise the feel of this song, Blaze. called Blaze. Uh, I'm not playing you the whole songs because you can understand they're all actually brand new and we're piecing them together and hopefully um, teasing you for the future. Um, Amazing. Trevor um, scored all that out and was uh, the great thing about working with Trevor is um, he comes across and I plan my new ideas and I tell him the theme of the lyrics and um, he goes away and thinks about it and then sends me ideas and concepts but the brilliant thing is Trevor sees the whole picture, and uh, for a songwriter, that's amazing. Well, this is this is a question I um, I really want to ask you. Is I'm a songwriter, so you're thinking about the song. When did you, as a drummer, think that it was you know? Because I played in loads of bands where the drummers just like, if I want to really dominate here and be louder and make more noise and show off. When did it hit you that you thought the song was so important? <clears throat> 
I didn't mean to ask you such a tough question. You no, should, no, no. You seem to have not, got stunned. It, it, it's like I had this epiphany that, uh, you know, a few years ago. You had a girl called Tiffany? No, no, no. No, no. She was, that was uh, someone else. Okay. Yeah. No, no, not Tiffany. Um, but I had an epiphany. Okay. I, I had an a religi- awakening. A religious experience. Yeah, if you like, yes. Yeah, okay. It was an experience anyway. Okay, yeah. Okay. And uh, I realized that, you know, when a drummer plays a drum feel, You've got to think, am I playing this drum fill for me, as in ego, because uh, I, I want to show my chops off? Or am I playing this fill for the song? Does this song need this fill? And I mean, can I get away with something a lot simpler or does it actually even need a fill? I yeah, mean, you yeah, figure yeah, that a yeah. fill is something that takes section A into section B. You're going from a, a verse to a chorus or a chorus to a verse. Mm-hmm. OK, and it doesn't need to be some big announcement. It's yeah. something that helps one section move into another. Yeah. And so making that or finding that realization in playing helped me play much more for the song so it was a case of taking it out taking stuff away that's great minimalist yeah 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 that's 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 you know i've I've, I've wanted to know what what how you saw that because so many drummers um aren't that way and and when you're as a producer i was you're almost sort of saying have you listened to the song here this is a chorus this is a bridge and actually with trevor working on my new album and these other songs we're working on um it was a revelation to me how much trevor really 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 did think about the songs more than i ever ever perceived and it's usually a month after you're playing the song you suddenly get so in love with what the drum parts are because as a songwriter you said that's another hook that is a hook and some of those drummers i've always loved seem to do hooks right on those great records right. even with even with black sabbath you know you'd hear and and deep purple they become they become hooks in their south don't they absolutely yeah, yeah. um you know this is uh be, people be interested in the q phil thing because it's my show um uh what was it like because you've mentioned this before, when me and Brian were working in Nine Ockenden uh, Road in Islington in a little flat, we didn't have drums, right? But, right. We, had, but we had ideas, and we'd bring you up to our flat to right. try to portray what we wanted a real human drummer to do. Right, well, before you had a drum machine, and you, you got the little Roland 808, which to this day is still an amazing machine. Yeah. Um, so they didn't have a drum machine, so they play the drums with their mouths. So, you know, you mean, like, me, you mean me and Brian, right? Brian, it would be. <laughs> they record I like, that. I like, I like, yeah, and, yeah. and you're hitting, you're yeah, yeah. hitting my uh, leg. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Try trying to hit it in time, though, if you can. Okay. All right. But they, so they would play the drum parts, and I mean, it sounded really good. And then they'd play the bass and the guitars and sing over the top of it, and they were really cool, like four track demos. Uh, well, I have a little surprise for everybody here, um, <laughs> and probably for you, Trev. You probably haven't heard this for over 130 years, something like that. Um, this is a four-track demo that we wrote right at the beginning of the Q-Fill days. Um, four-track demo called Shock the Body to Life. And this is the kind of thing that we gave to Trevor and said, study this. Poor bugger had to study this and then think, how can I put this onto a real live drum kit? So this is made in the Islington flat right back at the beginning of the 80s, a four-track demo of Shock the Body to Life. Stranger than fiction, the way that 
<laughs> oh, I can't help but laugh. Um, that's a four-track demo from the beginning of time. In fact, funny story about that song, Shock the Body to Life. Um, we, QPhil, um, had a song coming out called Go For It, and uh, we wanted it not to be Go For It. We wanted it to be Heroes Never Die. But when we played all our demos to Clive Davis, the head of Arista Records, he said, this song, Shock the Body to Life, that should be your next single. Well, we totally ignored him. That was the kind of thing we did in those days. And... Uh, we put Heroes Never Die out. But that's the kind of demo that our Trevor had to put up with and came to my flat to study. Can you believe it? That's what we used to give to Trevor and say, listen to all this. <laughs> We'd say, play that. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Play that. And and so I'd interpret that. And uh, then you know, we'd get into the studio and then I'd get to the microphone and go... <laughs> <laughs> they say, no, 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 we want it on the kit. <laughs> and then at the end of the session, when he left, we'd go back to that. <laughs> and go, yeah, yeah, let's just keep it with our mouths, shall we? <laughs> but don't tell him. <laughs> it would upset his soul. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I've got to. So that, that's, we've been unified, you know, as a. Uh, it, as a threesome, really, even though we've all done different things, all up to this point, which I've, we were just 20 minutes ago seeing, talking to Brian. We were indeed. In England on Skype. And uh, it's, I still find this really, really, really quite amazing that the nucleus of three players that started back in... When, when, when did we really meet up in London? Wow. Um, Are we talking um, early, late, late 70s, right? Late 70s, early 80s, yeah. And, uh, and here we are, very, very old. And then we all live five minutes from one another. Yes, and um, even though we might be wearing glasses and you're in a straight jacket and you were wheeled in by a nurse. <laughs> I was dragged in in a straight jacket. What are you on about? Well, that's what happened. When... <laughs> I, I, the thing is, what you've got to understand is I totally didn't agree to this. I was press ganged. I was, you uh, know. Let's that's, that's, that's time down again. Time down. We'll just use the first part of this. <laughs> hey, I got I got to jump back here again about this writing music and everything. When we Qfil were recording um in Battery in London and Willesden, uh, Mutt Lang, that famous producer for um so many hits was working on Def Leppard. Now, the Qfil album, uh, which I know you all worship out there, all three of you, um we we had we were forced by our record company to use a Fairlight machine, which is a, like the first of a sampling machine. Even though we'd done Dancing in Heaven with Trevor live, we wanted to keep drums live. We fought very hard for the next single, Heroes Never Die to Die. We wanted Trevor to play drums on that as well. But we sort of had to succumb to using this Fairlight. And right? it was the prototype. Yes, yeah, so we went to a, stu a studio, I think, God. I John Congress oh, studio. thank you, Trevor. Yeah. Yeah, John Congress, South African guy. Um, I mean, he had this uh, first machine, right? Yeah, it was the prototype Fairlight. Yeah. Now, all I'm thinking about is the song, so I'm not really concentrating, but our keyboard player, Chris Richardson, uh, he read music, and he was very musical, and like Trevor, he wrote music down me and brian we were the savages we just made noises but trevor and chris were really the ones that would take our ideas and develop them so trevor i remember pro programming and getting involved in the programming of some of the songs on qfil now this by doing that and reading music and which our keyboard player understood as well led um i believe you on to work with Def Leppard, right? Well, that's right, because I was like the in-house session drummer as we were the band, yep. um, you know, for uh, Zomba, which to start with, Jive then, Records, yeah. which then yeah. led on to Jive Records. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, right. Yep. And we were the kind of the in-house band. So because I did all that kind of work with QPhil, I had that knowledge. And what they were doing, what Mutt Lang was doing with uh, uh, Def Leppard is it was a revolutionary idea that he wanted to take that music and program it into a computer called a Fairlight. Mm. But no one had ever done this before. That's right. And what they needed to do was have someone come and transcribe all the drum parts out from a rehearsal tape of the Pyromania album. So it was the whole album. Now, was, was, it, was, was it the drummer, had he had, he had the accident? No, no, I, I actually shook that hand, the one that, wow. he, yeah, yeah. Wow. They, so, they, they yeah, Ricky they, Allen, yeah. Who lost it in a car crash. That's right, right yeah. Um, <clears throat> so 
what the, what we had to do was I transcribed the whole album, the drum parts, mm. and then we had to find a way to turn it into like a computer code to program it into the Fairlight. Oh, oh. Now I, you know, so we called them the midnight sessions. I'd get over there at midnight, oh, good and God. and it would be. Um, was this because it was, um, you know, it was downtime at the, and oh. the things, and they were working on programming the drums into a um, a Lin drum machine to start with. Oh, so. For First, it was into a Lin. Yeah, Lin first drum. of all, they put it into a Lin, and then we, you know, converted it over the drum charts, and we put like twos and ones, so we knew where we could put the beats into the actual computer <sighs> to, to to find a way to program this it in. This is so intricate. Yeah, and it was, and it may, I didn't quite understand yeah. to start with, and so there'd be Mutt Lang. Well, that's, and, uh, that's understandable because yeah, you're a drummer, right? right, right it, it's not easy to sort of lock into life, right? Not, not really. No, no. <laughs> don't, don't talk to me about life. And so Mutt Lang, Mike Shipley, and myself would be in the studio, and from time to time, you know, like Ricky Allen had come in and mm. and see what was going on, and he asked about. And he was quite know. into it. These oh, drums yeah, going, yeah, yeah, no yeah. problem. Uh, but no mm. one truly really understood what was going on. I see. Right. Yeah. And so when it came to time to going to uh, John Conger's place and you know working with the Fairlight, yeah, it was like. Well, I'm not quite sure they've got a keyboard. So they took you on to the next stage. The next well. stage of programming it. And so then they play the keyboard and they had, like, each keyboard note would represent a different drum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, oh, I understand. And so what we did, and it took about a month, we programmed all the drum parts. Was it you actually playing it into the machine, hitting, your, hitting the notes down? No, we didn't really need to. Wow. Uh, it was like on a computer screen. We just put, ah, put okay. the notes in. Okay. And then the, it was the strangest thing. When they pressed play, I mean, you'd hear these drum parts come back, but there was no cymbals. It was just kick, drum, toms, and snare. And I read, uh, well, I've recently been speaking to the engineer, Nigel Green, great friend of ours, who did the q record, survived the q went on to... Def Leppard and probably didn't survive. But he um, he was saying that a lot of the demos they do, even for everything that Mutt does, it's snare and kick and they look at guitars and cymbals later. Right. Interesting. Um, so yeah, we programmed it all in and then when all the drums were done, Ricky went back in and put live cymbals over the top. Oh, okay. But when we heard back just the drum parts, it just sounded so weird. It sounded so stiff and rigid. Right, right, and right. And obviously it was in perfect time. Yeah. But Ricky, when Ricky put the cymbals on it, it sounded like a drummer playing. Well, we're talking about all this perfect time and programming and uh, hitting keyboards. Let's listen to you, Trev, actually doing the real thing, live playing, um, which um, is what it's all about, really, isn't it? Um, Trev has been playing on a very, very um, experimental track of mine called... Um, the Buddha of Frankfurt, that's about a philosopher that um, I have great respect for, and uh, Arthur Schopenhauer. It's purely instrumental, but it really shows how Trevor just takes this thing and expands it. See if you can uh, work out all the different time signatures. I told Trevor just to do his thing on a basic back and track, and I'm going to come back later and construct on top of it. But you're very clever if you can work, work out all the different timings that Trevor plays on this track. Okay, we'll go back to Def Leppard in a moment.
That's uh, Trevor <laughs> letting go on uh, an experimental track we're building on called The Buddha of Frankfurt. And you'll hear Trevor counting the bars at the end. That's for me, so that I understand what I'm dealing with. You'll hear him on the end trying to say, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six. Yes, he has to educate me on what bars are. But my God, did you hear the kick drum? That's for all you musos out there, all you uh, up and coming drummers. My God. Um, when Trevor lets loose, the world moves. Well, let's go back to the uh, incredible story of Pyromania and Def Leppard because Trevor was involved right at the very birth of this iconic, huge album. Now, this is an interesting question. What was it like to work with the mysterious uh, Mutt Lang? At the time, he was fine because we were all discovering something together. Yeah. We were doing something no one had ever done before. How long did it take to do all this? I mean, this is a Pyromania record. This was the Pyromania Ooh. record. Yeah, I think that went Ooh. on to sell quite a few copies. I mean, it's become a megalithic kind of iconic, huge mountain of a I'm, record. I'm and and give, I think it started with you. I'm giving you a bit of a scoop now because no one actually knows this. So OK, hang on a minute. Everybody get ready. You only get this on Radio Owl's Nest. This is a scoop from the great Trevor Thornton. Right. So I'm transcribing Ricky Allen's drum parts. Every time I got to a feel I didn't like, I put one of my own in. <laughs> I like it. I really, really like that. That is a hell of a scoop. And right. he's revealing it to you. <laughs> because the authorities cannot get him at this point. Right. Well, right. so you, and why didn't Matt or anybody else realise what you were doing? Because we were programming it in and when we listened back oh, to it. Oh, man. Yeah. You should have had a credit on that record. Uh, you know, I always wish I had. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, you should, damn me, you should have had a credit anyway for being there at post-production. Well, but they don't, it's interesting because even, you know, Nigel says there's a lot of things where the stories won't really be told about this record. It w exactly. Yeah. I mean, they, they probably don't like the idea that no one actually played on it. Yeah. Because it was all done on a computer. Yeah, I yeah. think that was probably the first album because that was the forerunner to Cubase and Steinberg that's, and all uh, those. Yes, that's yeah, right. That's yeah. Very, that's... So yeah. So anyway, jumping on there, you you really should have got a credit for Def Leppard. Um, it, unfortunately, I didn't. I did actually mention because yeah. it was Mutt Lang, and I, you know, I realised he it's was a big a, deal. He was a big producer so this was going to be a big album yeah. it was like i would really appreciate a credit on this and it was all like yeah yeah no problem of course the album comes out my name's nowhere so yeah 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 i know that's like it was for all musicians when we first came into town you know now i want to ask you because trev you you you, t you teach people right i do teach so for any of you out there that uh, want to be a drummer or you've got a child who wants to be a drummer, who anybody wants to beat anything down and to make a noise, you should contact Trevor Thornton. Now, it's not really advertised. It's just word of mouth. Right? It's, uh, it's word of mouth but or, you... or mouth and foot. Yeah. <laughs> but you are doing lessons. And, you, and so it, it, it could people that are interested should contact you. It's right? possible. Yeah. OK, good. Um, I haven't I haven't upset you with that. Right? I, I have a very small opening. I don't, I don't know how to follow that. I, I heard, I had heard rumours, but I really didn't know how to follow that. We'll, we'll leave that there. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> what a way to finish. Yeah, I think we'll put some echo on that and just let's go out. I have a very small opening. Uh, how can you really follow that? Well, let's fo <laughs> let's follow it with some more music. Uh, Trevor's just played some amazing drums. Um, on an arrangement of a song I'm working on that's called You Are My Home and that's what we're going to listen to now.
That's a song that uh, I'm working on now. You Trevor has just laid down some quite exceptional drums on that track and uh, still working on it, still writing lyrics, but uh, you can hear the how Trevor is uh, helping me develop it. That song is called You Are My Home. So tell me, Trev, before we go here, yeah. um, what have you been doing recently with Mr. Page? Oh, that's me, by the way. I've been playing on a lot of your songs. That's I right. um, uh, Probably a couple of years ago now, I set myself up where, with Martin's help and a few of our friends, uh, set up my own home studio. And, uh, That's a great it, studio. Yeah, we got it all tweaked out. It sounds great. Thanks also, a uh, shout out to Bobby Summerfield. Yeah, and, for his and help. Mike, Mike Rodriguez. Yeah. Mike Rodriguez. Yeah. And uh, so I've set myself up a very nice um, Pro Tool studio. So it's all tweaked out. And so I have recorded a lot of Martin's uh, latest material, although one album we actually did over at Bobby Summerfield's. Yeah, which we're still working on, which is pretty exciting. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that which is sounding amazing. I mean, what, Thank what, you, you, what you've done with the drums, they do sound incredible. Now, Trev's been playing a lot of my material, and uh, actually, in a way, three whole albums we've got in the can, haven't we? Right, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been just a fantastic um, re-collaboration, really. It's, I still think it's pretty amazing that we're sat here in a room in California, and yet we started all those days ago, and um, yep. still having a giggle, aren't we? We certainly are. Well, I hope you come back again, Trev, because I enjoyed that, and maybe we can talk about some other things besides you having a small opening. <laughs> <laughs> so it just remains for me to say trev cheers oh, cheers no. trev cheers, cheers martin yeah. and thank you trevor for You're dropping in at thank radio you. owl's nest and being my co-host and keeping me honest well reasonably honest i uh, just want to remind you that you can pick up um all my solo albums on uh cd baby and uh, iTunes and Amazon and Google and I'm sure millions of other places because they sprout up all the time, don't they? Anyway, you know, I hope you enjoyed the show today with uh, Trevor Thornton, my drummer, from all the years back and, and actually to this very day. And both of us are going to say goodbye to you from the Owl's Nest until we see you again. Thank you again, Mr. Trevor Thornton. Thank you, Martin. It's been a pleasure. And I will see all you Owl Heads next time in the owl's nest. <laughs> <laughs>